So I will spend, I will spend a few slides on the introduction, stuff which should be known to, to everyone, but need to be said nevertheless. Then I will discuss a few slides on the setup of the problem. Then I will discuss proof, you know, how the proof of semi-global existence flows. And after all this is said and done, we will discuss the actual formation of the trap surface argument. Okay. So afterwards, we will maybe spend two slides on related and future work and then give some references. So uh, we are studying the Einstein equation general relativity, as we all know, according to the general theory of relativity, a space time is a four dimensional manifold M, including three plus one dimensions, equipped with a Lorentzian metric T, which itself satisfies the Einstein field equations. You know, this is all very well known. R new is the its curvature tensor, R is the scalar curvature, and T new denotes the stress energy momentum tensor of the matter field under study. Okay, here in particular, we're going to be discussing uh, the Young Mills tensor, okay, which takes the following form for you know, a uh, Young Mills curvature to form that will explicitly explain how to construct. Um, so it was on November 25th, 1915, that Einstein, Einstein presented his equations uh, to the Prussian Academy of Sciences. And indeed, we all know that this was um, a big breakthrough in that, you know, suddenly gravity was realized as, uh, as geometry. And in the early years, you know, research followed two broad directions. The first one was work towards experimentally verifying the theory that Einstein put forward. In other words, you know, if the theory is even cohesive and mathematically correct, if it doesn't correspond to what we actually see in the real world, there's no really point, a point, there's not really a point in studying, right? And uh, also there was work towards identifying explicit solutions to the Einstein equation, right? So this is of more interest to, to, the, to the current talk. Anyway, it didn't take long after the appearance of the theory for the first non-trivial solution to the vacuum equations to arise. So this was given by Carl Schwartz uh, also in 1915. And it takes the, you know, the form we all know. Uh, so it was given, but nevertheless, it took more than 15 years, about 17 years, uh, for people to realize you know, what exactly was contained in the solution. So it was first realized by Lemaitre in 32 that you know, the Swartz and Lemaitre contains an energy region B with the following features. So any observer that actually enters B cannot send a signal to an ideal conformal boundary of infinity denoted by I plus. And moreover, every time light or null to this that gets to enter, you know, B is uh, future incomplete. So when you know physicists and mathematicians first saw these uh, properties, they the consensus was that they were hoping for them to be accidents or pathologies present only because of the high degree of symmetry already present in the spartan solution, and that in a generic setting. You know whatever that was meant to be because you know at the time there was not really a notion of an initial by problem for general relativity such phenomena would not arise and of course uh, you know these hopes were spectacularly falsified by the results of Penrose in the 60s in which uh, you know Penrose obtains his, his celebrated incomplete theorem which won him the Nobel Prize partly in 2020 uh, and uh, to give you know to, to, to give his theorem to develop the notion of a trapped surface. So, uh, given a three plus one dimensional Lorentzian manifold, a closed space like two surface S is called trapped if the following uh, two fundamental forms chi and chi bar have everywhere twice negative expansions, so traces. Okay. So here, you know, we have the, the Levitz zeta connection, L and L bar denote a null basis of the two-dimensional orthogonal complement of TPS in TPM. And X and Y are arbitrary as transient uh, tensor fields. Now, intuitively, what these uh, traces represent is the infinitesimal change in the area of the, the spheres in the future. So, um, trap surfaces are such that you know their area decreases along any possible future direction. And the theorem uh, says that if Mg is a global hyperbolic space time with a non compact Cauchy surface, and you know M satisfies this, this uh, 
null and empty condition here for all non vectors p. And moreover, M contains a closed trout surface, then M is future causal intermediate incomplete. And of course, uh, this you know tells us that we have GDS incompleteness. This indirectly you know signals uh, the presence of singularities, but of course it doesn't tell you, you know, what type of singularities you're gonna meet, whether you're gonna be curvature singularities or other. But as often happens in um, mathematics, once you solve one problem, maybe 10 more arrive, right? So a very natural question that, that naturally arose from, from the developments of the time was uh, whether trapped surfaces are dynamical objects. Because at the time, you know, the existence of the trapped surface itself was too strong an assumption to begin with. And the only way at the time to guarantee its existence was to already assume its existence in, in the initial day. So before I say anything more, let me you know, make a philosophical point, if you will, which is why, you know, as to why the dynamical formation problem is still important. So this has, you know, the dynamical formation problem has often been termed the test of reality for black holes, right? So, and, and may I say that this is more important perhaps nowadays than ever before, because, you know, now scientists have succeeded in capturing the first image of the black hole and so on. So there's what mathematicians define, you know, as black holes, and there's what physicists define as, as, as black holes. And to make sure that what we mathematicians study actually corresponds to, to the real, I think there's, it should verify some tests, you know, if, if indeed it's a good definition. So, uh, one of them is dynamical formation. So they should be, you know, black holes should be able to form dynamically from a time when they were not present. So it really bears like high physical significance, this, this question. Yeah, there are other, of course, tests of the art, like stability, etc. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the first existence result of trapped surfaces is due to Shane and Yao, uh, where they give conditions on a trapped surface uh, to exist on the initial slice. Uh, the first fully dynamical uh, you know, result is a series of papers by Christopher for the gravitational collapse of the scalar field. So in a series of papers, Christodoulou uh, manages not only to prove uh, trapped surface formation in spherical symmetry for the Einstein scalar field uh, system, mass massless field system, but also to obtain a complete picture, picture of gravitational collapse. Okay. So he also proved that there were naked singularities with, with appropriate initial data and that these were unstable and so on and so forth. But the breakthrough by by Christodoulou came in 2008, you know, because in the absence of symmetry, not much was known at the time. So the breakthrough by Christodoulou came in, you know, in 2008 in the absence of symmetry for the Einstein Viking equations using a method which he termed the delta short pulse method. Now, in the delta short pulse method, a very particular hierarchy in the initial data is in is encoded in the initial data, if you want, such that, um, first of all, this hierarchy is almost preserved upon the evolution, along the evolution of the Einstein equations. And why was, you know, such a, a problem, you know, difficult? Well, knowing the, you know, monumental result by, by Christodoulou Kleinerman on the stability of the Minkowski space, if you want to see some, something bad happen, like a trap surface, you would have to have large data somehow. Also, however, you would need to have large data that are large in a controlled sense. Otherwise, you would not even have hope of proving, you know, an existence theorem for long enough time to allow a trapped surface to form. So, you know, Christodoulou gave a solution that balances this to 2008. A future developments, you know, consequent developments are important developments. I cannot uh, claim that this is an exhaustive list by no means. But uh, is the work of Kleiner Marodiansky uh, a year afterwards on trapped surface formation using a different scale. Some of the benefits of the Kleiner Marodiansky approach are that, first of all, they induce, you know, Crystal Lewis work from say 600 pages to around 120 pages. They reduce the number of curvature, uh, you know, derivatives of curvature uh, to one, and they use a slightly, slightly different scale. Uh, in 2014, this is, in my opinion, a very, very nice result, uh, along with all others, of course. 
And so Anne Luke asked the question, how small can the data be for one to guarantee a job service? So Anne Luke in 2014 gave a theorem on a scale critical drop surface formation criterion in a finite list. Scale critical here means that the data, you know, the, 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 the metric in HS, you know, only has to be large in H3 halves as opposed to crystal rules H1, for example. Um, subsequent works uh, include the work of Anne in 2019 on which he gives a, a scale critical formation criterion for the Viking equations. But using something which uh, we are also you know, exploiting in the current work, which is a signature for decay rates, that's true. And then, of course, there was a, a development by Jan and Atanasio in 2020 on the Einstein Maxwell system. Okay. Now, let me spend a few minutes discussing a little bit about the Einstein Gambit system. And let me say from the get go that, uh, you know, in, in opposition to the Einstein Viking and the Einstein Maxwell systems, uh, the Einstein Yang Mill system has exhibited non trivial dynamics, even in spherical symmetry. Okay. Uh, first of all, the numerical results of Bartnick and McKinnon in 88 implied the existence of a countable family of soliton type solutions which were you know, static and globally regular. Uh, the existence, however, of, of such solutions was rigorously, rigorously shown by smaller Wasserman, Yao, and Matilde, back in 91. In uh, 1990, part of McKinnon solutions were implied to be unstable against perturbations. And in uh, 93, smaller uh, Wasserman and Yao proved the existence of an infinite number of black hole solutions to the einstein general system. But for the SV2 uh, gauge group in, in spherical symmetry. And these results you know, already show that the Einstein Young system, even in spherical symmetry, is, is dynamically flexible in the sense that you can see uh, you know, global solutions and you can also see uh, singularities for. So, a very natural question would be to ask you know, how, if at all, can we you know, give initial data in the absence of symmetry? That give rise to an Einstein Young Mills uh, black hole, you know, trapped surface, first of all. So, in a recent preprint, Puskar, um, Mondal, and Sintiao prove a semi global existence result for a characteristic initial value problem for the Einstein Young Mills system for large of open classes of initial data. And the data are also allowed to be large. So, it's a very good result, a great result. Uh, but you know, in this paper, it's not yet highlighted uh, along with you know way the large should be to make sure that we get a trapped surface eventually. So this is the question that we address in, in the current work. So we found trapped surfaces for the Einstein system. The framework we adopt is you know we work in double null gauge, and let me talk a little bit about how these double null correlations work. So the space time that we were going to construct will be covered by a you know, double null foliation, which is given by three-dimensional incoming null hypersurfaces, H bar U bar, which are these perp sort of perpendicular surfaces here that we see. Outgoing null hypersurfaces, H U, okay, and their pairwise intersections, you know, through topological two spheres, S U U bar. So we shall be working throughout with normalized vectors of three and four, such that you know, they're have this particular normalization, and the metric takes uh, this particular form right here. Okay. And we also put the Young Mills uh, theory on, on MG. The ingredients are a smooth principal G bundle, where G is a compact, let me stress, semi simple E group. This implies that G, the E group, admits a positive definite uh, non degenerate and bi invariant metric. And the group's V algebra admits an adjoint invariant post the definite scalar coordinates. The way we, we you know, proceed here is we choose a vector space V and a matrix representation for the action of G on, on V. And we consider associated vector bundles over the space time with standard fiber isomorphic uh, vector space V. Now, Cross sections of this uh, you know, uh, vector bundles correspond to, to various fields whose dynamics we want to, to, to discuss. 
And to do that, we need a covariant derivative operator you know, on this. So a covariant derivative operator on this panel is naturally induced by a fundamental connection uh, on the principal team panel. And itself, in turn, induces, once you choose a local trivialization, a one form on some local chart for the base manifold M with values in the chosen matrix representation. See, so we also provide uh, one form. If dim G is the group's dimension, and you assume that the, you know, the vector space, the tunnel space to the identity of the algebra has a basis of, you know, dim J, uh, K times K real value matrices, where K is the, you know, the size of the group's representation. We proceed to define, you know, the connection one from the field as we see here, okay? And the curvature uh, two form, which is given as we see here. So for non-abelian groups, this term is, is of course non-negative, uh, non right? Uh, for for abelian groups, this term doesn't doesn't appear like in Maxwell field. Let's say. Our results are as follows. So in collaboration with Buscar and Mundal and Simpson, now we have examined the Einstein Daniel system, and we have given two theorems. The first one is as follows: it, it is a semi-global existence result. So given I, you know, which is supposed to model the initial data, there exists a sufficiently large A0 such that if A itself is greater than A0, and we have smooth initial data, chi hat and alpha f, where alpha f will explain what it is. But we should keep in mind that this is you know the total freedom we have in the in the in the description of the initial data in the characteristic initial value for example. So if they satisfy this um, largeness condition, if you want, uh, along, you know, u equals u infinity on the initial slides, and Minkowski initial data along u bar equals zero, then the Einstein Young Mills equations admit a unique smooth solution in the region that we see here. So between u infinity and minus a over two, and zero to one for u bar. So we're talking about this if you want, right? So u bar goes from zero to one, and here you know, goes from u infinity to, to minus a over four. The second one steps directly on the first one and is a formation of trapped surfaces statement. So if in addition to the assumptions of the semi-global existence uh, theorem, the initial data also satisfy the following isotropic condition along every, you know direction along u equals u infinity, then the space-time arising as a solution to the previous theorem contains a trapped surface, so at the very you know, tip of the, the space-time, so it's like minus a4 from one. Okay, but nevertheless, you know, young Niels is a, is a gauge theory, right? So, you know, one would hope that one should prescribe a gauge, right? Um, so this already presents certain difficulties. First of all, there is a local, you know, there is a lack of a global gauge uh, choice, and this is, you know, a topological fact if you want. So the orbit space of the theory cannot itself be covered by a single chart. So the space of connections modulo bundle automorphic. And you know, traditional choices which may work, let's say, in the abelian cases, do not in general work for a general non-abelian. Non so you know, the Lorentz case is known to develop finite time coordinate singularities. And, you know, the Coulomb case also, also fails for different reasons. Um, in any case, in the present work, this is what I want to uh, we circumvent the problem of gauge fixing by performing all necessary energy estimates of what in a gauge invariant way using the fully gauge covariance derivative. Uh, I will discuss how these estimates are obtained. Uh, later on in the in the existence proof. Okay, and here here I defined the gauge covariant derivative. Uh, it is defined as follows, as you see. But you, you can already see uh, what I mean here. So the truly you know rich characteristics of the Einstein and Niels manifest themselves when we do like high order energy estimates. 
estimates. And to do higher order energy estimates, we take commutators of, of this uh, gauge covariant derivatives. So in the commutator of the gauge covariant derivatives, you can see that we only see curvature, young Nielsen and Riemann curvature. So that, you know, we do not use explicit information on the connection uh, one form. So let me present the Einstein Young Mills equations, the form that they take in a double null foliation. So we work with the following system R mu minus a half R G mu is like this. And this is the Young Mills tensor. We introduce null tetrads EA, EB, E3, E4, where A and B are one and two. And require the renormalization condition that we see here, the traits are here, you know, you have the Dirac. Here you have minus two, and there are no sort of mixed terms. We choose to work uh, in terms of the Y of curvature, W, V, alpha, T, uh, and we define the now Y curvature components alpha, alpha bar, Vita, Vita bar, rho, and C. In the same frame, we decompose, uh, so we get the Ricci coefficients, chi A, B, chi bar A, B, eta, eta bar, omega, omega bar, and zeta, the torsion, so to speak. And finally, we decompose the young Mills curvature to form F into the following components. So we have alpha F, we have alpha bar, we have rho F and sigma, and we take the form. So with this, we express, uh, you know, everything in terms of structure, equations, and the Bianchi equations, and now young Mills equations, as we will see. So these are the structure equations, the, the form that they take. These are, you know, structure constraint equations. And these are all rather well known. Um, and the Bianchi equations, the form that they take. Um, now, for the Einstein and Mill system, let me note that the scalar curvature vanishes, and hence you, know, you can say that R mu nu equals T mu nu, et cetera. But the Young Mills equations themselves, uh, you know, this is the Bianchi identity for the curvature form, and the Young Mills equation itself, take the following form this form, where everything you see hat is like the gauge covariant derivative, but project. Now to the, the horizontal exercise. The difficulties that are present, um, some of them are, are as follows. So, first of all, the Bianchi equations contain, you know, because now we don't work in vacuum. So they contain a collection of terms that are not present in the vacuum equations. These terms cannot always be estimated through the null Young Mills equations. So, for example, if you look at the Bianchi equation for beta right here, you can see that uh, the term D4R for A is going to contain a term which looks like this. The point being that we do not have a null Young Mills equation for nabla 4 alpha f. As you can see here, we have for nabla 4 alpha bar f. So, one way to overcome this issue. Um, is to introduce sort of renormalized components, beta tilde and beta bar tilde. And once we sort of write everything in terms of alpha, alpha bar, beta tilde, beta bar tilde, rho and sigma, we see that, you know, such appearances at the level of, you know, uh, the, the Bianchi equations disappear, but, but only for beta and, and beta bar. So it is not something that it is imperative that we do, but it is something that, that we choose to do in this work. So we work with the renormalized beta uh, tilde and beta bar tilde. Because, you know, uh, but in any case, the Bianchi equations for alpha and alpha bar imply, nevertheless, that one cannot hope to avoid uh, having to control the terms for which there is no non-linear equation. Up to and including the level of derivatives of curvature. Why is that? Because uh, let's say here, for example, 
this term d4 uh, row alpha beta is going to contain terms like this. So you want to, it's going to contain terms like nabla 4 alpha f. And of course, you want to close them at the level of derivatives of curves. Um, so let me briefly mention how we do this. Uh, you say, okay, you do not have, again, this is rather, you know, uh, so, so you don't know nabla 4 alpha f, but you know nabla 3 alpha f. So you do a commutation. And the result you get is, okay, uh, you know, you get some, you get nabla 3, nabla 4 alpha f, an expression for that. And then you continue, you continue like that. And similarly, you do nabla 4, nabla 3 alpha bar. And that's how you control it. And uh, finally, the young Mills equations need to be handled on one level of differentiability higher than the Jefferson components. And for this, we use elliptic estimates to address this issue, as we're going to see. And, and the reason is again the same. So here, you know, there's derivatives. Uh, okay. Uh, something that I want to stress, and it is uh, very important in, in the current setting, is, is the notion of scale invariant norms and how we use them in, to structure the proof. Okay, so we make use of the symmetry for decay rates, S2, which was first uh, introduced by uh, Sin and An in his thesis. Uh, and later, you know, understood that, you know, this can also be important in trapped surface formation results along different uh, regions. So, you know, uh, the signature for decay rates as two is a way to encode the expected behavior of various components involved in the equations in terms of size. So the way we do that is for its, let's say, bile curvature, rich coefficient, young Mills component, we assign a number sigma two called the signature for decay rates. So every time E4 appears in the definition of one of those guys, you award it with zero. Every time an angular derivative of EA appears, uh, you award it with a half. Every time E3 appears, you award it with one point and then subtract one. So for such, you know, for these guys, we define the following scale invariant norms carefully. So in L infinity scaled, we have A to the minus S2 of phi, U to the 2S to phi plus one, times the original L infinity model. Now, I can already tell you that we should think the way we're gonna, the, the way the proof goes, that we are hoping to bound all of these norms by the initial data. Okay, so unless this term is like uh, anomalous, there are a couple of anomalous terms as we're going to see. The behavior you should you should expect to see is is given here. So so phi less or equal than let's say a to the s to phi divided by u to the two s to phi plus one, etc. This is the behavior we are expecting to see upon upon the evolution. The same happens for, for L2 norms, L1 norms, and norms along the null hypersurfaces. Okay. You know, uh, what I want to stress here is not so much the, the details of all the of all the norms, but but more or less how they go. Okay. So really we introduce uh, three types of norms. We introduce norms for the you know gammas, we introduce norms for the curvature and for the young mills. So we introduce infinity norms, uh, as we see here, okay? Infinity norms for the curvature and infinity norms for uh, the, the young mills components, alpha f, rho f, sigma f, alpha bar f, and infinity norms for the, the, the null derivatives of alpha f and alpha bar f that you cannot directly control, as I said, from the null young mills equations. Um, okay, already we can see sort of what I mean. The, the hope, the hope is that this guy, let's take you know, this scale infinity norm here, should behave as u squared over a upon evolution. Uh, so then we, you know, go on to 
give the, the two norms, right? So L2 norms, which we give here. And then finally, we give the energy norms. So the energy norms are given here, you know, for 10 derivatives of curvature and uh, 11 derivatives of the Young-Mills components. With one catch that the derivatives, that the energy norms for nabla 4 alpha f and nabla 3 alpha bar f, precisely because we only care about handling them at the level of derivatives of curvature, are also 10, right? So it is the, the pure young means that tends that, that go up to 11 derivatives of curvature. And then, of course, we develop some total norms and the elliptic norm, which uh, will be useful, you know, we, we will do a bootstrap argument to close this norm with regards to the elliptic estimates that I don't have for. So why use these norms, okay? So it might seem, you know, unclear, but the way that these norms are built, um, they achieve two important goals. The first one is a conservation of signatures and the balance of signatures along every transport, every constraint, every behind and every young mills equation. Uh, moreover, you know, as I, as I explained, the Einstein young mills equations um, you know, we hope to give norms such that in evolution of this large initial data, most of these quantities are bounded by one in these norms, with the exception of a few anomalous terms, such, such as, uh, let's say, trace guy here, but for which we still have an, uh, uh, you know, an expected behavior. But perhaps, you know, one of the most important uh, aspects of these scale invariant norms is the way that they are built allows for one to use the holder inequality and gain a smallness factor. So here, for example, phi one, phi two in L2 is less or equal than one over U, phi one in L infinity, phi two in L2. The point being that we gain a one over U term here. Now, because U is thought to be large, this is a smallness factor. And Indirectly, this says that as we are estimating transport, energy estimates, blah, 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 we have a smallness, uh, we gain a smallness factor from the nonlinear terms. Let's contrast this to, say, Kleiner Marodnianski's delta scale norms, uh, for which this holds delta to the half. Uh, here, the smallness is measured from the fact that delta is small, and the result is obtained, you know, if you obtain space time, let's say from zero to one, so to speak. But here, you know, it's sort of different. You go initially in, in, from zero to one in, in let's say, height. Okay. Uh, here, it's sort of different. Okay. So you're not delta uh, restricted, you're the region of size one. And you go all the way up to the. And let me also mention, for example, that you know, uh, and this is very interesting, that S two is defined the way it is, but the way Kleiner and Nyansky define the delta scale norms accordingly is they use S one, and what is S one? S one is changing this to one and changing this to zero, so awarding different directions with different different points. Okay, so one goes here and zero comes. Anyway, let's discuss a little bit the strategy of the proof of uh, semi-global existence. Um, first, this is, you know, again, uh, no, no big surprises here. So the proof of semi-global existence rests on the following sequence of estimates. So first we saw that the total, let's say, reach in order is controlled by you know, curvature and young mills. Then we saw that the top order norm is controlled by Curvature and Young Mills. Then we first prove the energy estimates for the Young Mills components, then the energy estimates for number four alpha f, number three alpha bar f. And finally, we prove the energy estimates for the curvature uh, R. Okay, and then based on those estimates, you know, you can uh, use a standard procedure to invoke the proof of, of semi global existence of this of your space time. Uh, here, we are not assuming the extra condition on, that we're going to use in theorem 2 for the trout surface. 
So new ingredients compared to the vitamin Maxwell cases um, are the following. So you need a more you know, careful handling of the a NABLA 4 alpha F, NABLA 3 alpha bar F terms. You also need a careful handling of some extra terms that appear in the commutation formula in the case where the group is non abelian And also, you know, the energy estimates for the young Lewis components in the world. These are clearly true. So let me give a picture for, for all of those. Uh, we begin by imposing the bootstrap assumptions, uh, the gamma norm less than gamma, et cetera. Using these bootstrap assumptions, uh, First of all, we get some estimates from the metric components, right? As we see here. To be able to discuss uh, any sort of dynamics, we need to obtain inequalities for the transport equations that are involved, let's say, in the null structure equations. Okay. And this takes the following form as you would expect. But actually, for equations along the, the, the E three direction, sometimes the borderline terms that we get in our analysis necessitate more precise estimates. So typically, a borderline term contains trace chi bar, which, which behaves like this square over a. This is the worst lead square fixing throughout throughout this work. So it turns out that. The coefficients in front of trace chi bar play an important role in the following sense. So, if nabla 3g plus lambda 0 for some lambda 0, trace chi bar g is some other you know, uh, term h, and if lambda 1 equals 2 lambda 0 minus 1, we have a sort of weighted transport inequality that is actually better in terms of the analysis compared to this. And this is the one in our work which we mostly use when we deal with uh, NABLA3 uh, equations. So after, after this has been obtained, uh, we obtain a Sobolev embedding theorem, which is given as follows. So the scale and infinity norm of a section of this uh, bundle is controlled by the sum from zero to two of the L2 scale norms of the corresponding things. And finally, um, to be able to deal with multiple angular derivatives uh, in our work, we need to develop a computation formula, which is you know, cohesive with the problem. And that is the following, right? So say we want to understand up to I derivatives of G, and G satisfies number for G equals some term F1. Then NABLA4, NABLA IG takes the following form. So here, sum at J1 plus J2 plus J3 equals I, that's the, the subscript here. NABLA J1, eta plus eta bar J2, NABLA J3, F1. Where let's say here, NABLA J1, eta plus eta bar J2 means the following. We have J2 terms, J2 appearances of this eta plus eta bar with various derivatives each time, but the sum of all angular derivatives is J1. So this is this is the mutation here. And then we proceed, you know, this is this is the commutation formula that we obtain. And similarly, we obtain the following commutation formula for cases where we have number three uh, at G equals F2. So I have underlined here the terms C1 and C2 because as it turns here, these are extra terms, let's say, compared to the, the vacuum or, or Maxwell cases, and they only appear, let's say, in the non abelian cases, but, but they need to be handled here at the level of generality that we are, we are looking at. Uh, okay, so as I said, going back to the, the first step of the proof that we're hoping to get, you know, how do you obtain you know, a bound on the, on the region or by curvature and young years and things? So we use the bootstrap assumption and let's say, you know, we give, we give an example of what happened. So under you know, the assumptions of the main theorem and the bootstrap assumptions, the chi hat norm in L2 up to 10 deriv you know, derivatives is controlled by one plus the R, R of A. So if we go back, for example, to, to 
to here. Sorry. So if we went back to here, let's say. So, so we would see the term here. Okay, up to from, from J between zero and ten. And uh, proceed as follows. So to mount this, we begin with a structure equation. We commute with I angular derivatives using the commutation formula just discussed and obtain the following uh, equation, okay? Which you can control using the bootstrap assumptions. Right. So you put the one over A to the half because the expected behavior is A to the half throughout for character. And you carefully bound uh, using the bootstrap assumptions the the corresponding terms okay and the result follows uh, so so you keep doing that for for all the terms that are necessary and with regards to elliptic estimates now for the top of the derivatives of the rigid coefficients we recall here the definitions of divergences scales and traces for a covariant tensor of an arbitrary rank so these are given as follows and the key element in elliptic estimates uh, is the following. Like under the bootstrap assumptions, if you have you know, the divergence of a tensor field, the curl of a tensor field and its trace, you can you know, control i derivatives of phi in terms of i one i minus one derivatives of its divergence, curl, and, uh, and trace. And using this, uh, we can show that the elliptic norm is bounded by the terms that we want to see being bound. So, as an example, for example, we look at 11 derivatives of, of the rich coefficient omega magnetic function. So, under the assumptions of the main theorem and the bootstrap assumptions, there holds this bound, k1 okay, plus r. So what you do here is you introduce an auxiliary quantity, omega dagger, which is defined as the solution to number three omega dagger equals a half sigma, with zero initial data on H u zero. You then introduce the following pair of scalars, minus omega omega dagger, and define this very helpful quantity kappa by this, this expression here. The point of this expression is that kappa itself obeys the following schematic equation, which is relieved of any uh, nabla curvature. And this is very important, very important uh, to, to go on. Okay, so here we are able to obtain adequate control up to 10 derivatives of kappa bounded by this that we're hoping to find. And then we use the diff curl system. Okay, so it tells us this diff curl system, going back to the lemma that we discussed, that if you want to bound 11 derivatives of omega, well, you can control this by one less derivative of kappa plus uh, derivatives of theta plus some terms which are lower or negative. And passing, you know, this sphere you know, to, to the L2 scale norms, we arrive at the result that we want. So, you know, these elliptic estimates uh, for omega, for eta, eta bar, uh, they, you know, reduce, but no, they, they don't reduce, they are heavily reliant on these difficult systems. Uh, but this is this is sort of also, well, you know, well known in the, in the literature, this, this sort of thing. Uh, here, let me discuss energy estimates for the Kerouac components, and let me say from the get-go that we, you know the method that we choose is to, to integrate using sort of the Bianchi pair method. Okay, so you can observe a particular structure in the Bianchi equations, you know, which is that for pairs that have the following form: so alpha, beta, tilde, beta, tilde, rho, sigma, rho, sigma, beta, tilde, uh, beta bar, tilde, and beta bar, tilde, alpha. This is a tongue twister, I'm sorry. Alpha bar. We can rewrite the equations for y1 and y2 in the following form. Um, 
this take the following form. Okay. So number three y one plus a term trace chi blah 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 minus d y two is something, and number four y two minus holds the um, y one is is two zero, and by commuting we get you know pi and qi essentially. So one can show that for such sort of pairs, uh, if you want to bound the energy norm in along h u and then along h bar u bar. Well, this is controlled by the initial uh, data. So, you know, this is in H to infinity, this is in H bar zero, plus this space time integral terms. Now, by the time, you know, we begin to, to tackle the energy estimates, we have obtained the elliptic estimates and the rich coefficient estimates. So, as to make sure that uh, we can bound these guys. Uh, we can bound these guys in a meaningful fashion. Right? And uh, this is basically the, the idea of you know, how the energy estimates for curvature go. And the energy estimates for the Young Mills component are also handled in the same way. Uh, so let me sort of give an idea of, of how this can happen. Right? So if f is you know a gauge invariant, let's say object on the space time, let's say a function, the following integration by parts identities hold, um, which put together give you this. So a space time integral of nabla four f one, nabla three f two, nabla three f three is given by this. Uh, this expression here that that we see here okay so so this is what we're going to use to sort of integrate but the way the way we do it is we plug in f1 to be the gamma delta squared uh, you know norm of alpha bar f rho f uh, gamma delta squared sigma f gamma delta squared and by the compatibility of uh, uh, nabla uh, hat with the you know the fibers here the metrics uh, you get that nabla for f1 is two times alpha f nabla for alpha bar etc so once we put these guys together we, we calculate alpha bar f nabla for alpha bar f rho f nabla three rho f sigma f nabla three sigma f and if we add these terms together, we get divergences at the end of the day of, of these terms here. And upon integration over the topological two sphere using the divergence theorem, this gives terms that are algebraic in, in alpha bar f for f and sigma. So using ideas like this, um, we are able to uh, obtain the following corresponding proposition for. The Young Mills energy estimates. Okay, so for this sort of two Bianchi pairs, they satisfy these types of equations. We are able to obtain the same thing, the same, the same energy identity. And again, by the time we reach here, we have obtained estimates that are adequate to control these two uh, space time uh, integrals. So this is this is how the proof works. Um, so after all is said and done and existence has been shown, uh, the formation argument is uh, rather more, more simple, okay, it's rather simple and, and short. So the proof of existence along with the estimates that we have obtained in the process also provide us with a proof of trapped surface formation. And the idea is, is sort of the following, um, first of all, we understand you know we want to understand uh, this term trace chi plus a half trace chi squared this is given by minus chi half squared minus two omega trace chi minus this chi uh, squared so remember we want to understand this uh, at uh, let's say sorry here we want to understand you know trace chi right here so what we do using the nabla for trace chi equations is we estimate what we know here from here 
And in turn, what we know here from here, using the, the you know, uh, E3 uh, evolution equations of, of chi hat squared and alpha hat squared. So long story short, um, the, the important thing is that having obtained all the estimates that we have obtained, these you know, E3 equations of chi hat squared and, and alpha hat squared obtain certain terms, which are, are given as follows, which, however, we are now able to bound by a good enough term. Okay? And the same holds for, for alpha. And at the end of the day, using this sort of idea, we're able to, to see that trace chi at the very tip, minus a over four, one part of one part, uh, theta one, theta two, is less than or equal to minus four over eight, so negative. And that is the difficult trace. The easy trace uh, is trace chi bar, which you can you know, show that, that it is negative in an easier way. And ultimately, you get that trace chi bar is also negative for all points on the two spheres. And because these bounds are pointwise, then we conclude that the surface uh, S minus A over 4 comma 1 is trapped. So dynamical formation, uh, you know, what are, what are you know some related works that, that we can hope to to pursue, you know. Um, so in talking about trapped surfaces, an interesting question would be to find untrapped initial data that gives rise to a hypersurface, which just about you know signals the, the property of being trapped. So apparent horizons. Okay. So in collaboration with Martin Lesur, uh, we obtained. Uh, Cross initial data that give rise to apparent horizons. And we also tested uh, dynamically the Perot's inequality and uh, verified it in an open region in the future of the initial data. Um, but something which is also you know, very, very close to my heart is um, an extension uh, that we're hoping to do for various different matter models which would be such as the massive, let's say, scale of the uh, tension. But more importantly, of course, this is very optimistic and, and you know, still very, very, still away from us is uh, the Einstein Euler system. Okay, in the Einstein Euler system, it would be interesting to study trapped surface formation. Uh, but the problem there, of course, is that you know you may get uh, shocks and loss of regularity of the space time before you are able to form a trapped surface. And whether you know, one would be able to balance these two interactions and how one would hope to do it, it would be uh, difficult. Plus, I mean, here we have you know different uh, different characteristics for the you know, acoustically known metrics and the, the actual numbers. So, so it's very far away in the future, but it's definitely a very interesting problem. Uh, of course, it would work for for, for appropriate. You know, uh, suitable Euler or anyway. Uh, this is pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, I don't know how we're doing for time. Yeah, okay. So here are some uh, some important uh, works that I want to, to show. And uh, yeah, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, All right. Thanks, Nikos, uh, for a very entertaining talk. <clears throat> So I guess uh, now uh, now is the time for questions. So from the audience. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, please go ahead and ask. Uh, Hi, Nicolas. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, is it possible to ex uh, extend the, the result to the uh, case that the in initial ingoing non cone is not uh, uh, Minkowski? Ah, that is a great question. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, okay. Um, let's see. So, first of all, uh, we, I would think you know, what happens in, let's say, you know, the Viking case. So, in the Viking case, most of the draft set so yeah. results were, uh, you know, having, but this is a technical simplification, more or less, uh, that, that this part is in course. So, the answer is yes for the Viking, for example, and this is done in work by Luke Rodnianski. Right? So, by, by yeah. Luke Rodnianski, sort of give non trivial data on the on its part like this. Of course, their motivation was different. It was not primarily a trap transformation statement, which, if I'm not mistaken, they also obtained. So, their motivation was to. Um, Obtain you know local existence of, of impulsive gravitational waves, uh, which is a, a whole other you know interesting problem in itself. But modeling uh, you know what what this uh, you know people did, I am very confident that with appropriate initial data on on each bar, uh, you would be able to follow through with such a such a such a theorem if you want. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say anything until you know, this has to be shown, of course, but I'm, I'm very confident that it is true. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the next talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've, I have a quick question. Again, very nice talk. I'm just wondering what method you use to construct uh, co Cauchy initial mm -hmm. data on space like copper surface. You ah, mentioned that at the okay. very end. At the very end. So yeah. at the very end, um, we sort of cheat. Um, we first have a characteristic initial value problem. Uh, then, you know, we make sure that the way we have given initial data on this characteristic initial value problem, we have another transition region, uh, which is supposed to be close to Schwarzschild. And then we use a Corvino chain gluing to obtain, you know, a gluing of the transition region to, to a care space time at, at infinity. So essentially, once we have obtained all that, we say, here's, you know, here's your, your, your Cauchy service, so to speak. So okay. it's not like, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's you, how, how. You, I mean, you could use the, uh, the so called conformal method to construct these sets of initiatives. Yet if you want yes. to try that. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe. That I mean, it's, uh, it, it is well known how to do uh, the conformal method for the einstein yang mill system. So I'm noting that, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, yeah. Thank you, very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have any more questions uh, for the audience? I just want to mention that Jewel Liu also has a very uh, nice related result on, on you know, similar to, to this thing. I don't remember the exact uh, setting, uh, I'm sorry to say, but I, I just want to mention that Jewel Liu also has like a very nice result with a collaborator on this thing. Maybe, maybe Jewel can, can tell us himself. Right, yeah, great. Uh, okay, so uh, do you have uh, more questions from the audience? Uh, right. If not, then I guess we can stop the recording.